mental um, framework of society that has to start in Puerto Rico. There's lots of challenges that we can that we were confronted with early on in the response, like addressing. There's no systematic way of addressing in the island, right? So um, we would have had disasters. Um, Irene, um, Hurricane Irene was a prior disaster we had there. We provided aid, and at the time to record where we um, might have provided aid, it would have been the second house on the right on Calais Poki. Um, now, you know, some 11 years later, there's five or eight houses there. Um, you can't predict, you know, you can't say which house did we provide that service to uh, because there was no real way of keeping track of addresses. Um, they, you know, that's a basic thing. So we would um, acquire residences. After um, Hurricane George's, we went in and uh, built 1,200 new housing units. But we acquired those houses that were in the floodplain that were flooded and took them away. So part of the requirement for that funding is that the house is uh, demolished and the property is deed restricted so nobody can build on that property again and be put at risk. Well, unfortunately, there's two challenges. One, squatters moved right in as soon as the residents came out. And the politics of the towns, um, they became you know, voters or, or political interest, and the mayor didn't want to remove them, so you know, held up the funding. But two, more importantly, there was no way to record the deed restriction because they didn't have recordation. So those are baseline challenges that we deal with all the time in the islands that doesn't occur in Conus, and we take it for granted. So some of the, the money that we want to push out becomes a challenge. But um, I guess the last Part of that would be zoning, and it's, you know, wherever uh, you go in the United States, there's zoning, and you can't build in high-risk areas. But if you don't enforce the zoning, um, they may have a zone. Um, the Puerto Rico Planning Board does a pretty good job of adopting building codes and a pretty good job of zoning maps. It's the enforcement piece, and pre-storm, for a population of three and a half million people in Puerto Rico, they had nine inspectors for the entire island. Um, you know, that's usually one community, one small community. It's not a population that's the size of the 20, more than 25 states. So um, there's a real challenge in building capability at the local level before you can invest that 40 billion. And that 40 billion that you heard about earlier this morning, that's just recovery dollars you know, on top of what was already spent on the response, right? And there's billions in that one. But what I want to talk about is how we go forward. So we're, we're putting in place a lot of grants that, um, for, say, code enforcement. Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands just adopted the latest building codes. Um, now we're trying to build capability on the islands for them to uh, review plans, issue permits, conduct inspections, issue certificates of occupancy, to get more formal. It takes political will, but it takes assets, it takes resources to be able to do that. And we're funding the buildup of that, but it certainly takes a long time. And those are some of the areas that, um, in general, I think universities can help with data collection, data um, analysis, and then being able to get the message across in a non-political way. Because the one thing for sure about Puerto Rico and, and to some degree in the Virgin Islands, um, the politics interfere with the decision making. And we gotta take the politics out and make it all about risk. So the more we can neutralize politics and just make the discussion about how we reduce risk over time progressively, the better off everybody's gonna be. So going forward, FEMA, we're trying to get out of the small disaster business and focus on the catastrophic disasters. We're trying to focus on lifelines, right? The critical lifelines. So lifelines for us are the most fundamental services that communities need, right? It's food, water, shelter is one lifeline. It's energy, health and medical, communications, transportation, safety and security, and hazardous materials. So if you just Google lifelines, 
um, female lifelines, you'll see. That is now the way we're going to go forward. Those are the focus areas for us to build capability at the state level. And then the other stuff, the smaller things, you know, we need other partners coming to the table to help with these eight lifelines, but then all the other things. And if we, we can um, divide and conquer, leverage resources so that we know who's doing what aspects, then we could have a better result in the end. So we talked about planning. Catherine said um, New York State was the first state to develop a web-based hazard mitigation plan. We spend a lot of time on hazard mitigation planning, and it's critical. The process is, is really important to bring communities together, bring the state together. And in theory, those plans are supposed to uh, go through, assess the risk, and then strategize to how to reduce that risk and then put in an actionable strategy so that we can execute with funding. So then when you know the next dollar that comes in, you know where that should go. That's in theory how it's supposed to work. It doesn't really work as well as that and we need to improve that whole process. The partnership that FEMA has with SUNY and the partnership, well the partnership we have with the state and then to SUNY um, so we provided a HMGP grant of a million dollars to um, dishes here in New York, and then they contract with the state. We have a similar arrangement in New Jersey um, with Rutgers and with the University of the Virgin Islands in the Virgin Islands. Um, so they're helping develop the state hazard mitigation plan. If we can get to more web-based planning, that is more focused on risk reduction, it'll be easier for us than to take some of the other tools that we're talking about. <coughs> and for us, we're developing, we have developed already community profiles so that we take all the available information that the federal government has about what we've spent in that community. It could be rolled up to the county or to the state level so that we're able to help kickstart the whole planning process and take that information and load it right into their hazard mitigation plan at the local level to reduce complexity, make it simpler, um, move things along quicker so they can focus more time and energy on the prioritization piece. And that's the part that's missing, that we really, really need help from universities to help facilitate the discussion to prioritize the actions, prioritize the strategies, because um, if you have a hundred different priorities, it's not prioritized and we can't, we don't know how to execute. And that's what delays the recovery in the end of the day. We can dump tons of money, but until we know how the state wants to execute, how that local government wants to execute, we're not going to be able to move because the federal government's not going to do it without them. So, I hope uh, we have time for questions because I'd like to be able to have a conversation with you guys. Thank you. It's a real pleasure for me to, to uh, have a conversation with you today. Uh, I had the privilege last night along with Ellen to uh, give a presentation to you last night. Um, so what I'd like to do today is do a little deeper dive into some of the comments I made last night and really put some meat on the bones as it were. Um, before I forget, I did bring a fact sheet and a short four-page article uh, over there. Uh, there are copies over there if you'd like to grab them uh, after the presentation. And it'll give you even more information about what we're doing. Um, as I mentioned last night, our goal at the EPA is to empower all 40,000 communities across the entire United States to help those communities anticipate and prepare for the impacts of climate change. And I really want to focus on the word empower, and our regional administrator this morning emphasized this as well. We don't view our job at EPA as coming into communities and telling the communities what to do, but rather helping the, doing a lot of listening, having dialogues, trying to understand what the issues of concern are to the communities, and then empowering the communities to make more informed decisions. Um, again, this is within the context of EPA's mission. Uh, as Ellen said, each agency has their own specific mission. 
our goal is to work with those communities to help protect uh, the environment and public health. Um, I, I really love this, this photograph up here. It's one of my favorites, and it's actually in our climate change adaptation plan from the agency. Um, for those of you who follow hockey, that's uh, Wayne Gretzky. And uh, the quote is, I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. And if you wonder where we get our inspiration sometimes, it's from people like this. When we work with communities, as I mentioned last night, we want to help communities certainly increase their resilience to extreme weather events and, and climatic events under current climate, but we also want to work with them to build smarter. And again, you heard, you heard a lot about that this morning. Uh, we want to empower them to uh, and give them the resources and the tools in order to anticipate what future climate is going to look like and, and what those sorts of events will be in the future. So we want them to skate to where future climate will be, not where it has been. Um, we do that, um, oh, and I, I do want to again emphasize the challenge to us of trying to empower all 40,000 communities. We certainly at EPA do a lot of pilot projects through various programs to work with individual communities. For example, our Office of Community Revitalization, which is in our policy office, spends millions of dollars every year coming in and working with individual communities doing pilot projects. And in fact, they've been in Puerto Rico doing some, some projects. But in the program I run, and I work with people uh, in, in all of our regions, like Joel Siegel, who, Siegel who was here, um, is, is to try to figure out how do we get to all 40,000 communities and give them the wherewithal to make to build their own capacity and make decisions themselves? We do that through three mechanisms, excuse me, as I said last night. The first is through training. Uh, when we work with a lot of communities, they're overwhelmed with a lot of issues having nothing to do with climate change, feeding their people, educating their people, putting roofs over their heads. Um, and, and in many cases, they're not even aware why climate change impacts matters for the issues of concern for them. So we've worked and developed training modules. For example, we have a training module for local government officials to help them understand why climate change may matter for the things that they care about on a day-to-day -day basis. But again, this is an example about how we do business. We didn't develop this module on our own and throw it over the transom and, and say, this is why you should care. But rather, we worked with our local government advisory committee, which is an external advisory committee with mayors and county executives and others from across the country, public health officials, and we said to them, what would you like us to focus on as we develop our, this training module? And what they said to us is, don't focus on your individual programs at EPA. Focus on the services that we, we are trying to provide to our communities on a day-to-day -day basis, and that's what the training module does. Another example, we have a training module for uh, the folks on the ground who worry about Superfund remediation, like in places like Puerto Rico. And, and um, again, I'll share an anecdote with you that makes it very real. Uh, one of the pictures I still have in my head is one from Houston after Hurricane Harvey hit of a Superfund site behind a fence underwater. And the headline was, where is EPA? Implicit in that is, is this Superfund site that we've remediated, in fact, resilient to these impacts, or are those toxic materials seeping out into your drink, drinking water? I'm happy to say, and this is demonstrated in our training module, that when we did an assessment of how effective our remediation methods were to all the hurricanes in 2017, except for Maria, we're still doing that one, we in fact found that most of our remediation methods were in fact effective, and the training module helps people understand how, how to do that. Segwaying, the next way we empower communities is through the provision of tools, training, excuse me, uh, tools, data, and information. Things like the CREATE tool, which is designed to empower every single water utility across the country, regardless of where you are, to assess what your vulnerabilities are, to climate change impacts, and then to assess the different adaptation strategies that utility may choose to implement. Uh, our stormwater calculator, which you can use actually to, to zero in on where your home is and see how much storm runoff there will be from your own property, uh, as well as the community trying to assess how much stormwater runoff there might be into their sewer systems. Third is through financial mechanisms, financial resources. 
again, as I said last night, the one thing we always hear when we talk to mayors and others is, what can we do for you? And they say, give us money in order to make these things happen. Sadly, I can't speak for other agencies. I don't believe there's a single pot of adaptation funds anywhere in the federal government. I wish there were. So we as agencies had to take a step back. And what we realized at EPA is we passed billions of dollars to states, tribes, and local communities every year through things like our Brownfields Grants Program, through our, um, uh, through our General Assistance Program for tribes and, and others, through our SRF Program that transfers over $2 billion every year to states to invest in water infrastructure. And what we realized was a lot of times the recipients don't realize they can use those dollars in order to invest in climate adaptation. And in some cases where we have the authority to do so, we actually require that the dollars be used in that way, so taxpayer dollars aren't, aren't wasted on ineffective systems. In other cases where we have limited authority to tell uh, folks what to do with the money, we encourage them and make it clear to them that they can use the dollars in that way. And finally, very quickly, let me also emphasize, uh, especially for those of you from universities, we also invest heavily in research. On, on climate change. I used to manage the Global Change Research Program in our Office of Research and Development, and we invest tens of millions of dollars every year to support universities doing climate change research. So that's what we do. Now, one of the things we heard last, we, there are actually two things, I, two threads I want to pull together. There was an excellent question from the audience last night, or an observation from a student who had actually been an intern at EPA in our Office of Research Development. And she said, I'm aware of all of these tools that you have. Can, is there a better way to make them accessible? So people know you have them and that they can use them. That's number one. We needed a portal to get a central portal to get to all those resources. The second thread is listening to communities. As I mentioned last night, they recognize they're overwhelmed with all the climate information out there, like through the Georgetown Climate Center, Kresge, Rockefeller, Ickley, and others. And they're sitting there going, which are the right tools for us to use? And that's the quote I gave you last night. And it's a real quote. We don't need any more stinking tools. Please help us understand which ones are the right ones for us to use. And then give us the assistance to understand how to use the tools. Um, that led us to the development of our Adaptation Resource Center, which I mentioned to you last night. And um, it, it is unlike any other resource currently available to the public to get at EPA's resources. Uh, it in fact enables, it enables local government officials, this is not for the general public, this is for local government officials like mayors and county executives, to get a package of, in, of, of information tailored specifically to their needs. Once they tell us where they live and what the issues of concern are to them within the context of the EPA's mission, they instantaneously get an integrated package of information. And they can follow a thread, first starting out with helping them understand why they might care about climate change impacts on the services that they're trying to provide to their communities. If they decide they care, they can follow the thread to the array of adaptation strategies that are out there to deal with these issues. If they decide there are particular adaptation strategies they want to implement, they then can go to our case study section. And I have to emphasize the purpose that these case studies are not just stories. Stories are great, but once they read the stories about how other communities with similar issues of concern have successfully adapted to climate change impacts, we then have, we then lead to them to what we internally fondly call the quick start guide. It's like when you buy a television set, and you pull it out of the box, you don't want all that technical information. You want the three or four key steps to understand what do you need to do to replicate the success story other, another community has. And then we link each of those steps to the available tools. So we take them to the right tools that they can consider using, and we don't stop there. We then take them to actual people at EPA and other federal agencies that they can contact with phone numbers and email addresses. 
so that they can get in touch with them and say, can you provide me with the technical assistance to understand how to use the tool? I want to emphasize again, and I didn't get the chance to do this last night, it is non-prescriptive. We're not here to tell folks what to do, but rather to empower them to make more informed decisions. And finally, wrapping up, and I'll, I'll stop here, uh, I just want to highlight again um, uh, the opportunity I identified last night that uh, our ARCX system is a national system. We've got a big enough challenge trying to share information across the country, but we can't do a deep dive into any, any one, one state. So we're, we're making this offer to turn over free of charge the code and the content of the ARCX system to a host university in any state. We already have a number of universities already do, uh, doing this work for their states, and, and we would be delighted to work with any host university anywhere in the country to develop a state-level version uh, for their own particular state. And lastly, I want to emphasize that once we transfer the code and the content to you and give you the technical assistance to, to develop the state-level version, you own the system. It's not ours anymore. You can develop it in any way that you want. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, so this provides information on every single county 
and every single incorporated city and town in the state. And as we were developing tool, this tool, we traveled around the state and we talked to county officials and local government officials and their staff, and they were so excited to say, you mean that I'm going to have climate information specific to my small town? And they said, I don't normally have to go to the next town over, who's much bigger than me, and just use their data because there's nothing specific to me. So this really empowers them uh, to make some, some decisions on their own. So we're looking at Muncie, Indiana here, which is where Ball State University is. It's kind of in the northern half, northeastern half of the state. So on here, you can look at land use data. You can look at uh, the social vulnerability indicators from the US Census. Uh, and then you can also see floodplain data from our Indiana Department of Natural Resources, which has floodplain data that's slightly more updated than what FEMA provides. So uh, once they go through that information, then we can provide them with a readiness assessment. So the previous two slides and all that climate data is open to anybody. But the readiness assessment is only open to local governments. So what this is, is that it's an assessment that's tailored to every single community. So the community is not going to be asked if they're doing actions that are not relevant to their jurisdiction. So they're not going to see questions that are for a county government. If they're a city government, they're not going to see questions related to river flooding if they don't have any floodplain in their jurisdiction, which is true of 137 communities in Indiana. So uh, specifically, it had, the readiness assessment includes eight worksheets, and they include 22 specific climate impacts that will happen in Indiana. And then underneath of those impacts, we offer between one and five actions that a local government can take to prepare to, for that action or to mitigate uh, that impact. And then those actions are asked in the form of a question. And the question has between one and, has specifically between one and five, uh, has up to five options that they can choose from. And it offers different levels of preparedness. So level one, for example, is no, I haven't done this action, we haven't considered it. But level five is, uh, yeah, we've done this, and we've done this in a very compre comprehensive way. Uh, and so when we beta tested this tool this summer, we had a, a local government town manager say to, me, say to me, you know, I was going through the readiness assessment, and I was mostly checking twos and threes, but every single time I was looking at the next level up and thinking about who I could partner with to make that happen. And so we were essentially just spelling out what they needed to do. And through the conversation with those beta communities, we realized that you know, one of the very strong aspects of this tool is that town managers and mayors already have a full-time job, and we're throwing climate change on that, and they have no experience or training, the majority of them, in, uh, in climate adaptation or sustainability or climate science. And so if we can just kind of lay out for them exactly what they could do to start to manage these issues, and that would be really helpful. So uh, so this is the Food and Resilience Index that I hope you'll, you'll check it out. So the next tool we'll talk about is ARIT, the Environmental Resilience Institute Toolkit. So uh, at the end of Joel's talk, he mentioned that they are happy to give this uh, the Adaptation Resource Center at EPA to any university uh, in the country to have them kind of make it their own. And Indiana University did that, uh, and we now have ARIT. So, uh, what we've done is that we've taken the ArcX tool and we've made it relevant to the Midwest and specifically to Indiana. So, you know, there are plenty of tools out there like this. You all know that. I don't have to tell you that. Uh, but when you go there, they all talk about sea level rise. And when a mayor from Indiana visits an adaptation tool and it says sea level rise, they immediately close out of it because they think, that's not for me. And so this tool is very much focused on our state. Uh, and and uh, so and, and in the left navigation menu, what I always point out to mayors, this is going to walk you through step by step from top to bottom how to prepare for climate change. So at the top, we have what are the implications of climate change? How do I do adaptation planning? What are the specific adaptation strategies that can be used to prepare for climate change? Um, what are my peers doing successfully? to prepare, um, there's funding, there's training, it's all the stuff that ArcX offers, but it's just designed in a way that looks like Indiana uh, and, and feels like Indiana. So we're constantly updating this tool. Uh, this is not something that just has been sitting there. We launched it about a, a little over a year ago, and we've added uh, over 25 case studies specifically about Midwestern communities doing adaptation work. We have between 1,000 and 2,400 page views per month on average. Uh, and it cost us, the contract, uh, 
of course, EPA provided all the information free of charge. It was amazing. Uh, so that really got us started. Uh, and then we hired internally our, um, our IT department to help us build it. We signed a contract for $14,000. We didn't use all of it. So that's all it costs for us to develop this just for the state of Indiana. So this is great. And now we manage it with uh, 20 hours of staff time per week. So we have graduate students that are writing case studies and interviewing folks and constantly adding new tools and then pulling out things that are, are not relevant to me. The final program I'll mention is our resilience cohort. Um, this is absolutely one of my favorites. I can't say good enough things, uh, enough good enough things about this program. <coughs> so this is a group of Indiana local governments working on greenhouse gas reduction. So in 2019, this past summer, this is the first time we ran this program, um, we had 14 communities sign up to do greenhouse gas inventories. Prior to this in Indiana, we had three communities in the entire state who had ever done a greenhouse gas inventory. And one of them was sort of like half complete. <laughs> so, uh, so as a result of this program, we have now have eight of ten largest Indiana cities have completed inventories, which makes up 35% of our state's population. Uh, we partnered with ICLE USA to provide the technical assistance, and the communities, all the communities had to pay was between $200 or $500, dollars, depending on their uh, their population size. And we did, gave them a, a student IU student to work with them over the summer to help them work on their greenhouse gas inventory. Uh, and it was really incredible how much this cohort program allowed the communities to then support themselves. So all the students, along with their uh, staff counterparts in their communities, created a group me uh, on their that app you know, that allows people to talk to one another, kind of as a joint text message. And so they solved all their problems, the majority of their problems, before they came to me or they came to ICLE. And so, and they knew about the resources, and, and ICLE has a platform, and uh, our office has a platform, and they were able to solve their issues before they came to us, which is the empowerment that, that Joel was talking about. So this is really incredible. And we're getting ready to launch uh, a second cohort this year that'll last uh, all year long, we'll start in January. We'll have these same communities do uh, climate action plans, and some of them will also do climate adaptation plans. So, um, that's all I have. So, to kick off our question and answer session, I want to ask a quick question to the panel and leave it open to anyone. We've heard about all these tools, we talk a lot about their usefulness and their utility, and we also know that disasters don't obey borders. Hopefully, they can cross, we talked about that a little bit earlier today, and that sometimes mitigation projects have unintended consequences for neighbors. Um, so how can these tools be useful for thinking regionally? Um, Kate, you might have some thoughts on that first. Okay. Well, so one of the issues that uh, that we're faced with here in New York is we have home rule for our for our authority, but hazard and hazard profiles have their own geography. And so our tool works with, for, this is going to get in the weeds for a minute, but most spatial is done, most spatial analysis is done with shape files, which are hard-coded static geography. We use what's called GeoJSON, which is the fluid version of that. And so, but we can take GeoJSON and turn it into shape files. So the, the ability to look at your area that you have the authority over, but then look at the size and shape of where you're going to be affected, having that flexibility I think is really, really important. And it's also 